with our climographs and uh, water balance diagrams in hand, we move to talking a little bit first about soils and also mainly talking about biomes. As we can see, this example in the background tied to that water balance diagram of any of the past, so we have our soils being washed off of this field here by an excess of precipitation. Again, having that runoff uh, example there. So tied to our soils, our video um, to get us in the mood, or song to get us in this mood for this video, is Dig In by Lenny Kravitz. And so we're going to be talking just very briefly around um, uh, this, these uh, examples of natural science branches within geography, environmental sciences branches within geography. Um, so things like pedology, uh, the science of soils, usually there's can go into quite detail on that, as well as biogeography, phytogeography, zoogeography, you know, these distributions essentially of different life on, an, on Earth, whether that's plants or animals specifically. And um, in this, we're not really going to go in any real detail. I'm just going to have a few slides, just kind of touch on a few aspects I want us to be most uh, knowledgeable about uh, and going to be quite brief uh, in terms of you know, these examples and also tied to a, a few global cycles that we've already um, have at least a little exposure to. Um, so for example, this global carbon cycle. So essentially just showing where different pools of carbon are, are moving around. Uh, so where um, pools meaning where carbon is stored and fluxes are where we're having exchange of carbon. And just I want us to be most familiar with essentially where the biggest pool of carbon is and where the biggest yearly flux of carbon or carbon dioxide within our atmosphere is. And so just to note, that um, specifically I'm here also just focusing on land, although we do have this example of our oceans as well. I'm just noting where our biggest pool and flux is. So if we look at these examples here, um, just to note them, and specifically on the land, you know, we, we've already talked about this kind of carbon dioxide weathering process, and we'll come back to weathering once again in a, in a later module. But just uh, you know, an example of, to note that really the fossil Pool kind of you know, and storing of carbon both in fossils um, that which we're now uh, burning a lot into the atmosphere and an example an example of things like natural gas, coal, um, you know, oil, but also just generally within the soil. Um, having uh, that's where a lot of our storage is uh, on the land, but then our kind of biggest largest yearly flux. Um, being within that plant biomass. And so that's where we saw kind of that yearly back and forth when we looked at climate. We looked at how carbon dioxide, even within a year, kind of has some variation. We talked about how in the northern hemisphere, you know, we have all that biomass build in the summer months. We actually see a dip, a kind of little reduction in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because a lot of that carbon is going into plant biomass. And it's, of course, released in the winter months um, when the plants senesce. Um, so we have a lot of that. But also, um, you know, in terms of our oceans, our oceans themselves kind of store a lot of, uh, have a lot of carbon storage as well as they cycle through in some of those ocean circulation processes that we've also talked about. So just again, to note where those are occurring uh, is a kind of little refresher. And also the uh, global nitrogen cycle, not going to spend uh, much time on this, but just to show once again where there's pools and fluxes of nitrogen. Um, because nitrogen is very important when we're going to be talking about plants here, we'll be talking about biomes. Um, it's generally abundant in the atmosphere, um, but really it can be limited in the forms that plants need it in certain types of soils. Uh, um, and so the lead us in just to talking about soils. Um, normally we could have large lectures, you know, uh, we could talk, you know, there's whole classes we could go into um, with the very specifics of soil. I boiled all that down to essentially this one slide. I'm not going to go too much in detail with this class on our soils, um, because but the basics that I want us to know is I mean there are a variety of different soil types um, across Earth's surface. We could look at maps of this, um, you know, where the main um, types of soils are distributed across Earth's surface. Um, but to note that you know basically what that comes down to in terms of those distributions is that there's um, the soils, these different types of soils have different mixtures of organic matter. And minerals, so kind of this, you know, things that were once life and organic that have decomposed um, into an organic uh, layer uh, or some sort of mixture, um, but also more minerals and things that have been, you know, that are, are you know, based on kind of this geology and kind of parent material of that rock that has been broken down uh, into soil uh, that is distributed there. And so the soil composition and its classifications are based on five main factors. Uh, the climate, so actually, you know, and we'll be talking about how that uh, is built into things like weathering again in a future lecture. 
the actual organisms that are living within the soil, again, tied to that organic matter component, the relief of that soil, or its topography, um, and the, its parent material, again, or the actual rock that it's made out of in its geology, and simply time, you know, has there been enough time, in some cases, for soil uh, and rock to be broken down into soil. So we can kind of condense all of that if we take the first word of many of those, um, of the CL of climate, but then uh, the first letter of all those other words, we get this clorped as one way to help us remember those main types of components. So I just want us to remember that uh, when we're tied to thinking about soils and you know why they're so important, because of course they're the medium within our plants grow. And so there is some influence on how soils impact uh, the geography and distribution of our plants. Again, that's going to be going to be beyond the scope of what we're going to cover for this class. But I just want us to note why soils uh, in this slide at least are important and these main components that have been covered here. So moving then in how more in that direction of plants um, and thinking about uh, plants are conducting photosynthesis. Of course, that's you know how they're creating their energy and, and essentially using that energy to grow. And so we have this um, essentially the net photosynthesis idea of how much they're producing. Um, minus the consumption that they're also using in respiration. And so this leads us to net photosynthesis to this idea of net primary productivity, which essentially refers to the net photosynthesis for an entire community of plants and essentially the energy amount, the amount of energy that is generated for that ecosystem or that biome or however you want to uh, determine that. And, and tied to that is essentially the amount of biomass or that if we were to take the dry weights and, and take the water out, but just simply the dry weight of that uh, organic plant material, essentially that's set telling us how much stored energy there is uh, in those plants. And then oftentimes, again, that's important in terms of ecosystems for, of course, uh, herbivores or other animals that eat those plants and you know, building our food chains and kind of those different trophic levels if you're inter you know, if, if uh, tied to our basics in ecology. Um, again, that gets a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about here, but just to show that example, and kind of an example forms here uh, on the left hand side, and essentially we have this energy coming in, that incoming solar radiation, that's energy that's received but not used by plants. Only some small amount of that, of course, goes to the actual amount of primary product production uh, and using uh, plants by fo in photosynthesis. Then, of course, some of that is, again, as I already noted, has been used by respiration. But the remaining part of that is actually that amount of net primary production productivity um, and again some of that then is consumed by herbivores um, and the remaining of that is what we term that remaining uh, plant biomass and so we can look at this at a global scale once again we have our maps we can look at how this is uh, you know the distribution of this net primary productivity so we can you know maybe even just pause here for a second you know let you do some map interpretation you've been building up your map skills so you know, look at this for a second and say okay well where do we see higher levels of net primary productivity where do we see lower levels? And also, can you actually explain that? Why does that make sense? So take a second here. You can pause if you like. Uh, you know, try and figure out why we're seeing this distribution in the map that we're seeing. Now, hopefully, um, you know, actually looking at this map for a second, we can start to discern. Okay, yep, we can see um, in some of our equatorial regions. So, like in South America here, in parts of Africa, you know, here over uh, in Southeast Asia, into even parts of you know, other uh, South and Southeast Asia, getting our greatest amount of net primary productivity. And so we can think that, okay, I mean, that would make sense. And this is, you know, as we looked at our climates, these are areas where the sun angle is always pretty high in the sky. There's lots of precipitation, a lot of those, you know, brought by that intertropical convergence zone. Essentially areas that generally where it's hum more humid, where you get more precipitation. So areas like the Eastern United States as well, parts of Europe, we're seeing this coastal parts of Australia, you know, these certain examples, and we're seeing that net primary productivity really based being based on sunlight and water availability, where, you know, the, when we go back to our map here, once again, our driest areas, so parts of the western United States, you know, the Sahara Desert, lots of the desert areas within, uh, you know, southwest Asia, central Asia, you know, other parts of Australia, um, you know, the Atacama Desert that we talked about prior, you know, all those examples, again, make sense where there's not really much water availability at all. And so, you know, that, that water availability is really driving, I um, mean, and as we're going to be looking at here now with biomes, you know, the, the plants, um, you know, it ties us to those water di balance diagrams, you know, and, and plants needing special adaptions, especially in those uh, areas of limited amounts of water um, to make sure that they can grow. So, that brings us to our biomes. 
And to define that, just you know, one example here, we could define as an assemblage or and an association of plants and animals. Um, in this case, we're going to mainly focus on the plants that form a regional unit at the subcontinental scale. So not covering a full continent like North America or South America. You know, they don't, none of these biomes cover all of that, but you are some subset within those areas uh, of, of specific vegetation types. And so said another way, these are, really, these are regions, um, you know, that are similar to plants that are essentially reflecting that climate and topography. So we'll be looking at in these variety of different types. Um, you know, this in, um, we had the map on the last page, you know, that full wide distribution of all of our biome types and where they're distributed here, showing kind of more of this general distribution of major biomes based on temperature and that moisture or aridity. So essentially, again, we have our vertical axis here showing annual amounts of precipitation and then the average annual temperature on our horizontal axis. And so we can see you know, where you see the most amount of precipitation, the highest average temperatures, we get our tropical rainforest. Similarly, you know, the same exact type of climate. Um, and so you know, um, we'll have some overlap in the naming of climates and the naming of biomes. Some of them are pretty much the same. Some of them will vary a little bit more, uh, as we see in this example here. And we'll be talking through these different types of biomes here. Um, and just to note as well, then, that a range of biomes covered vertically, um, if we were you know, to go up a mountain or down a mountain, especially in our tropical regions, is similar to that latitudinal change that we would get in climates from equator to pole. So we talked about that kind of in similar relation to our highland climates when we talked about our different climate types. So to jump into our biome types, again, some of these being very much the same or sim very similar to what we've already talked about. We have our tropical rainforest biome, just like our tropical rainforest climate. Um, so I'm going to be trying to note the kind of equivalent type of climates here in parentheses. And so just noting that, you know, in terms of the vegetation now that we're specifically interested in looking at, you know, things like this multi-story canopy, i.e. very tall trees, you know, very uh, humid kind of conditions all year round. Again, we can note our temperature maintains pretty steady. You know, lots of rain throughout the year. So pretty much always in surplus throughout the whole year. We're always having more precipitation than our potential of apotranspiration in these areas, even though it is quite warm. And so this you know, how it's expressed by plants is a variety of specific characteristics to living in this type of, uh, you know, climate and climate conditions and uh, biomes. So things like trees with buttressed roots. So we can show, see this on the top right here, a little bit obscure by the trees, but these very large roots that are kind of stuck that are even on the top of the surface um, of the ground instead of going deep into the ground because that's where a lot of our moisture and our, our nutrients for the plants are located very close on the ground. Um, you know, a lot of it would otherwise get washed down into the soil and not be accessible. Um, so the plants have roots kind of spread out right on the top of the soil to get uh, access to those uh, nutrients uh, that are within the soil. And we have also our kind of either wacky leaves and or just leaves with these drip tips that we can see here. And so much water course so much rain you know and trying to get all that water off of the plants um, because if we you can think of the plant, there's too much water that builds up on the plants um, all that weight can bring off their leaves you know essentially um, break them down so you know adaptions to get water running off of those plants and also things like what we term epiphytes so essentially these are plants going on other plants so things like vines things like ferns you know that we see here in this example here this this example picture where we can see you know these plants that you know, smaller plants that grow often on larger trees all over the place in those climate in that biome moving then to our tropical savanna biome uh, again reminding this is where now we're having much more seasonal variation in terms of our precipitation so once again our temperature throughout uh, average temperature throughout that year uh, stays pretty constant but in the amount of precipitation uh, is much more variable through our seasons. We have kind of a, a few months of the year that we have lots of rain and a few months of the year where it's quite dry. As I know, that's kind of expressed out in these areas where now we're seeing more of these abundant types of you know, grasses, but much more sparse trees. And the trees that we specifically have have certain types of characteristics, uh, like this example on the right, where these trees generally have flatter tops, kind of almost an umbrella type of top as we can see here. And the question is, well, why would that be important? Um, and we'll actually end up coming back to that. Uh, but just to note, um, before I move on, again, look at our um, climograph, look at our water balance diagram here. We're seeing now uh, we do have a deficit in part of the year 
but also you know an addition uh, kind of recharge of that and uh, an actual surplus of moisture as well in part of the rainy season when that intertropical convergence zone comes overhead and brings us and brings lots of moisture and so again the vegetation is adapted to deal with though these extended dry periods like the baobab tree, uh, and a famous example from Madagascar, the things that, you know, this tree has a long tap root, so very long, deep roots that run deep into the ground. It's able to access uh, moisture deep within the ground. Um, it does things like lose leaves in the dry season, so when it's not raining, you know, it takes a lot of moisture to maintain it, to maintain tree leaves. Um, you know, those will be lost off in the dry season to, to help the tree conserve moisture. Um, it stores water essentially within its trunk and also um, has leaves pretty high off the ground to resist fires that can occur within these dry periods. So all this and the specific characteristics that these uh, uh, tropical savanna uh, vegetation types have, you know, these trees have and other trees and shrubs have adapted in this biome to deal with these conditions that vary throughout the year. And we see this even further going into our desert vegetation characteristic where now we're having in our B-type climates, you know, even you know, very limited rainfall, usually across most, much or almost all of the year. Um, and so we have you know, even more adaption types to deal with that. So not only the tap roots that we already uh, talked about, so again, having a very deep central root that goes down to access some sort of groundwater, but also having what we can term succulent flesh. And so this is shown on things like cactus. So if you can actually get through those spikes of the cactus, you'd find that, you know, there's kind of this very waxy outer coating that helps keep all the moisture within a cactus. Um, so it's not losing out that moisture and drying out. Um, so other, you know, again, waxy coatings generally um, on reflective surfaces even, um, you know, on some of these kind of leaves or other types of services of the plants that, you know, we can think of if it has a high albedo, if it has a, a nice reflective surface, it's not absorbing, it's not absorbing that, uh, all that heat, and, you know, especially in very hot deserts, you know, it's not overheating of the plant, um, helping it kind of keep relatively cool by reflecting a lot of that heat off of, off of it. So, you know, we have a wide variety in terms of the range of arid environments so we can think of things like again here's our example from something like the atacama desert where because we pretty much have no real registered um, precipitation throughout that year of course we can think pretty much the whole time our evapotranspiration is going to be exceeding the amount of precipitation that is available and so pretty much always within this deficit you know, especially in these most arid of environments but you know as we move into our semi-arid step um, and kind of more temperate grassland areas, um, you know, we can note that actually because there is some more precipitation that's available, so this example from eastern Oregon, you know, we, we do see some, you know, amount of building of soil moisture recharge at times, uh, but again, largely, and especially in this case, in the summer months, you know, when we have uh, a temperature higher, there's much greater potential evapotranspiration usually than is precipitation or moisture availability. So, and we do generally still maintain within a deficit, but we do just have enough moisture that's available that we're seeing more vegetations occurring. It's just it's things like grasses or small shrubs that are adapted well to not needing very much moisture. You know, we're not seeing a lot of big trees that need a lot of moisture to grow and be maintained. However, when then we move to our temperate deciduous forest biome, we now see lots of large trees again because now as we see by our climograph and water balance diagram, we have plenty of moisture now. And we see this much more in things like places like the eastern United States, as an example, or parts of Europe uh, are just two examples where we see this. Um, again, where we're seeing plenty of moisture, but noting that the leaves uh, that are lost off of many of these deciduous trees, meaning that they lose their leaves part of the year, um, is now not based on wet versus dry conditions like we saw with the tropical savanna, but is lost. And we see the leaves lost because in the winter months because uh, protecting against the cold. So when it's very cold, we get freezing of those leaves that can damage the trees and um, you know, the trees to protect against that again will lose their leaves uh, oftentimes in autumn or fall as we term it. Um, and you know, again, that helps them conserve water, especially as well in winter months and, and not be damaged by freezing temperatures. So we can see that example here. We're generally, we have quite a bit of surplus um, and some amount of using uh, moisture at times within the summer months. If potential evapotranspiration goes over precipitation in some summer months, you know, when it gets hottest, but generally, you know, enough moisture um, that those you know, we're able to grow lots of large trees throughout much of that time period. 
contrast that to a landscape that might look a little more familiar, especially if you're from parts of the western United States and west coast of the United States. Um, so the Mediterranean uh, biome here now we see a lot more scrubby vegetation, you know, mixed with grasslands, kind of smaller vegetation, not a lot of large trees, um, but vegetation that's essentially similar in some extent to a desert biome. Um, but then that, then that you know, you're able to grow some vegetation because there's some moisture, especially oftentimes in the winter months. But you know, essentially we're having this vegetation that's adapted to living long periods in dry condition. And so of course these are still very fire prone. Um, especially at the end of long summers um, when there's been extended dry periods. But these plants are even adapted to that in that some of them need fire oftentimes to germinate and grow uh, new plants. So you know, oftentimes when we get a fire, we see that can see that as a devastating effect. But you know, some of these plants actually require that then to germinate and, and essentially regrow new plants over time. So we can see that see this in our in climographs and water balance diagrams here. Or generally, we have an extended dry period where that potential evapotranspiration exceeds our precipitation, but some amount of precipitation, you know, maybe in a few winter months, that does exceed and allow some recharge of moisture. And so, and we see this a lot, and especially in uh, parts of central and southern California. Uh, we, this is kind of one of our predominant biomes, and you know, we and, you know, and we just talked about a lot of fires that can occur then with this as well. Let me get this one example here. Um, and then with our fire, then oftentimes um, tied to that after the fires, especially if we get those heavy rains in the winter after a, a fire event, that can trigger a lot of mass movements. So things like landslides, mudslides, and we'll talk more about mass movements in a future lecture. Um, there's some pr recent examples here on the left-hand side from 2018, right-hand side there from 2005, just a few examples of these landslides or mudslides uh, that can be very damaging to many properties um, within these areas. Another example that we see here in parts of the West Coast and more we might term the Pacific Northwest being uh, our temperate evergreen forest biomes. So we're, and we're terming this being evergreen. We're pretty much, you know, we there are trees that we're building, uh, you know, we have that are growing in these areas, uh, maintain their leaves all year round. Because we have again a relatively lush forest cover, we have plenty of precipitation throughout much of the year. It's able to keep uh, these trees in evergreen conditions. Um, note that you know compared to tropical rainforests that have an amazing wide variety of you know, full species in terms of plants and animals, generally we have much fewer species here. But we are, um, if we're actually thinking about the temperate evergreen uh, biome. Uh, home to the tallest trees on earth. So redwoods get categorized into this category um, and knowing that those are, are quite tall in the tallest trees on earth, over 100 meters at the tallest or over 330 feet. So again, these, these uh, types of trees are able to grow very large structures again, because of the mo moisture availability there. And finally, moving into you know, more of our high altitude or high latitude biome so these northern coniferous forests uh, also known as boreal forests um, now more into our d climates and these often actually also are evergreen um, but to note that these trees have needles uh, instead of leaves so you know, these very small oftentimes kind of waxy outer coatings to them needles that again you know with that waxy coating are able to maintain moisture in because we can think that in these types of climates you know it's either quite cold we don't want that um, cold damaging the structure of a leaf um, but also you know that's just because it's cold if we think back to our humidity concepts there's just you know in, in very cold environments there's not a lot of moisture availability um you know there simply can't be much moisture held by uh in the air when it's quite cold and so we do, in some cases, end up seeing more moisture availability throughout parts of the year, as shown by our top uh, climograph and water balance diagram here, and other places, much more of a deficit, uh, depending. But we do, again, to have this general structure of trees, um, not only have those needles, but growing quite tall and narrow. And so this brings us kind of back in contrast with what we talked about earlier, with that example of the tropical savanna biome where those trees were kind of very laterally spread out kind of the umbrella canopy but here and now we see in our northern coniferous forest these trees that are very tall and narrow and then you know we think of things like pine trees 
fir trees, these other types of needle based trees. So the question is, well, why do we see this very different tree pattern of tree form specifically, uh, depending on these different types of biomes. And so you know, I show this to you here in this, you know, what I'm very proud of my like first grade painting example here of playing our tropical forest, particularly those tropical savanna type forests off of a boreal or high altitude or high latitude type forest, high latitude specifically, where in those tropical forests, you know, we end up seeing because we have that high sun angle, you know, we think that you know, generally throughout much of the year, as is shown on the left hand side here, you know, we have that sun angle coming in relatively vertically throughout much of the year, you know, it makes more sense for a tree to have lots of lateral surface as we saw in that example picture of our tree from the uh, tropical savanna biome um, to you know, essentially absorb as much of that incoming solar radiation as possible. We're in contrast to the high latitude forest, those boreal forests, because oftentimes throughout much of the year, the sun angle is relatively low. You know, it makes more sense to have a vertical surface area and be you know, very tall and narrow so that uh, that incoming solar radiation, again, can be absorbed at its greatest extent. And so we can see that here that, you know, the actual incoming solar radiation to some effect influences our tree form. And also, you know, the incoming solar radiation kind of particularly aspect of the land, uh, as we can term it. So aspect here referring to actually the angle, uh, you know, kind of this angle in terms of the sky angle of which our landscape is tilted or you are facing, you know, aspect also affects these potential evaporation versus kind of moisture availability uh, aspects or, or characteristics, I should say, make sure we're keeping our words straight there. So again, aspect affects potential evapotranspiration and thus kind of the deficit and or surplus that is available. And so this affects uh, what we term a microclimate, um, and especially in much of our mid latitude areas. So we can think that so we can see this north versus south facing aspect here, um, an example from Idaho, we're kind of in that south facing aspect we can think because it's south facing and remember in, in this example of our northern hemisphere, because the sun is always kind of southerly to some extent in the sky in terms of its angle coming into the uh, land surface, that if we have a south facing slope, essentially that sun is coming directly into that surface, um, it's much more acting like it's almost like a tropical area where that you know, sun is incoming directly to it. And it's almost like it's directly overhead. And so we get much more kind of per unit area surface warming and heating, you know, drying out essentially of that surface. And we can see that on that south facing aspect, there's really not much vegetation at all growing because you know, that sun is so intense on it. It's taking any moisture that's there and drying it out very quickly. Usually, if you know, if you're very cognizant of this, actually, and you go around in places like Eugene or in places you know, any mid-latitude location like we live in, you'll notice if, if, if you're very you know, if you're very keen that actually south-facing slopes are always the first to dry out you know, after a rainstorm. You know, they generally have different types of vegetation versus north-facing aspects, um, where now we can see actually we see a lot of vegetation growing on this north facing aspect compared to the south facing one because now we think we're tilted away from you know, not directly in that sun or you know kind of facing away from it and because of that we can think that any moisture you know precipitation that falls on that because the sun isn't beating directly on it it's able to be maintained there usually you know, the soils i mean the conditions that we find on these north facing slopes are are wetter, you know, they're always the last to dry out because the sun isn't beating directly on them. And so that's able then to maintain a lot more vegetation growing there. Um, and, and we can see, again, as noted back to this, um, being played out in these microclimates we see distributed across different types of slopes. So that's all we've got for you. Um, and we'll be tied to talking about more of that and thinking more of this biomes types within our lab this week.